The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene, and welcome everybody back to another exciting episode of As We See It. This is show number 19, being recorded on Sunday, November 27th, 2011. And as Gene said, I'm Ed Jupin in Boston, Massachusetts, studios of BaseNet Intermedia. And let's welcome in Holly and uh, Fred. Holly is back in St. Louis studios this week, so we have a better audio connection. Awesome. Well, it looks like a lot's been happening since our uh, very uh, exciting uh, Occupy conversation last week. It looks like, you know, now L.A. is facing uh, basically a huge test of sort of a peaceful uh, sit-in that they've got going on. And then in addition to that, uh, Philly is now, uh, the Philly Occupy movement is now meeting some, uh, some, some refusal to leave as well. And so it looks like this thing is really going nationwide. I mean, it is, it is going strong nationwide. Seems like Boston is the only one that had political backing back from literally day one, way at the beginning of the Occupy Boston, Mayor Thomas Menino in Boston said, uh, you guys could stay here as long as you want, as long as fill in the blanks. You know, meaning right. that uh, they didn't really get out of hand and uh, didn't do anything violent. But way back in literally the first week, he said, you guys could stay as long as you want here in Boston. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, I mean, it seems to me like this is a really good way to let people because I think if anything, the government should be mad at Wall Street. And I feel like if anything, they should encourage people to step up and try to do something. And maybe they should even try to work with the work with the movement somehow, you know, actually turn this thing into some change. Uh, I don't know. You don't know. What do you think? Well, no, I, 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 see, I have a pro. I, I still have a problem with people with people taking over public space, and it is their space as well. But I have a problem with you know this, the we have people have a right to. Protest. Well, well, what if, what if, just for instance, um, we'll make up a company, ABC Industries. Let's say ABC Industries on Main Street, USA, says we give. The Occupy uh, movement of, insert town here, USA, permission to use our property and to have your Occupy that particular town. Okay. So now it's not on private property. It's not in a public park or, you know, anything like you're saying. Would that change the tone of the whole movement? No, it, it would for me because they'd be, on, they'd be on private property with permission of the owner of that property to be there and do it. That's a little different than when a city gives you a notice, it's time for you guys to leave, and they just refuse to leave. And, you know, I mean, six weeks is not a protest. Six weeks is taking a residency. And, you know, a lot of, I mean, I don't have a problem with, with, with what they're saying about Wall Street. Wall Street is part of the problem, and we, need, we all need to take notice of what's going on. This is true. But, these kid, you know, these people out there, a lot of being college students, have been there. You know, they've been in places like Los Angeles for weeks, and they're taking over public parks for weeks at a time. I don't have a problem being there for three, four days. Make your point, open a park back up. When you're told by the city officials it's time to go, go, because otherwise you're in violation of the law. And that's, I mean, we live in a society where we're based on laws, and the law says if they tell you to leave, you leave. If you, and now what they did with the pepper spray and in um, in in California was wrong. We all admit that. What they did on the college campus was wrong. But at the same time, when you're told to leave, you leave. You peacefully demonstrate. You leave, and you know, and and that's and and that's the way they, they let you stay. Fine, but they tell you to leave. Leave. Yeah, but Fred, I mean, the law. I, yeah, but I mean, Fred, if everybody did that every time that they were, you know, I mean, the whole point of a protest 
is that you got to make some waves. And that, that's why I say, I mean, yes, I, I, I don't think that sitting outside of, uh, of, of City Hall, you know, although I, I, I think it's public property and they can sit there as long as they want to, but I mean, as long as they feel they need to. But here's the thing, nothing gets done without protests like this. And I think it's time to take these people to some sort of proverbial table. I mean, I understand your anger with them still sitting there, but what I'm saying is, why doesn't, instead of, instead of the city government saying like, oh, get off our lawn, why don't they reach out and say, listen, we need someone to talk to. What do you guys want done? I, I was just going to say, what's the ultimate solution then, or what are these people looking for? I'm trying to, I'm sticking myself in between the two of you in this conversation, Fred and Holly. I don't think Where, anyone knows what these people want. Yeah, what, 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 are, want. what are they looking for? They've been camped out there for months now. Um, it, we see no end in sight for it. They aren't putting anything on the table saying, if you give us this, we're out of here tomorrow. Right. What, what are they looking for? I mean, what but do I they want, and I to, are done, saying the what do they want thing? to be done to Wall Street? No, see, that's what I think, though, Ed, is I think you and I are actually saying the same thing is I think somebody, if they're really that, that adamant about sitting out there, if they're really that adamant about getting something done, reach out to them and say, hey, we're listening. What do you want done? What do you want, right. Table, because yeah, if nobody but... knows what they want, including themselves, that'll end this thing. Why don't we just go up to saying, the press? Get out of here. That's not going to go to the press anything. who's already there and say, hey, this is what we want. Because I'm going to tell you, what, what are we going to tell Wall Street? Oh, you can't make as much money as you're making? You can't do this? You can't do that? Wall Street's going to laugh at right. it. Right. You know, in the past two years. months, they brought up several facts. They... They had their discrepancies with Wall Street. They had their discrepancies with Bank of America. We haven't heard a peep about Bank of America in four weeks now since they rescinded their uh, stupid debit card, debit card fees. Um, okay, so, you know, they, the, the Occupy people were tossing out all of these different problems. The problems themselves went away, but the occupiers didn't go away. So what do they want now? Well, I'm, pro- gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and disagree and say that the problem goes way further back, as we talked about before. The problem goes way further back than that fifteen dollar charge. That was a that was a straw that on the top straw of, that a, broke of the camel's back, right? Yeah, but you know what? That's one of the things I think. You know, is there's this uh, there was this in the article uh, in Philadelphia that came out of the Philly News. Um, they actually interviewed a retiree who was out there giving them food, and he said, "Listen, either you guys are gonna organize and tell people what you want done." Or you're, or this is, or you're not getting anything done. You're just sitting out here. That's you know. And I think at this point, you know. I think we're we're all in agreement with that. It seems to us, if I could speak for everybody, that these people are just camped out now with no long-term goal. I don't. I have have problems with these people. That they, they. I don't even think they know the issue that that they're occupying for. You got signs for Wall Street. Signs maligning the troops. You got. You know, all kinds of signs out there, and again, like you said, you know, okay, what do you guys want? Because you, if you're going to tell Wall Street that you want to govern how much a CEO makes, or they're going to laugh at you. Well, I, I was at Occupy Boston a week and a half ago. I was going through South Station, and it happens to be right in the island next to South Station. So I walked past, and I was looking at a bunch of the signs and everything. And I didn't take pictures at that particular time or even interview anybody. I'm really thinking about going back, and if for nothing else, uh, for this particular show, of, um, well, photos obviously don't help us. They'll be up on our website. But maybe gr- trying to grab some interviews and getting something from the horse's mouth, so to speak, here. But just in the signs that I saw... There were still negative signs against the troops, as Fred just said, negative signs against the government, negative signs against Bank of America, and somebody on a loudspeaker shouting for change. That's yeah. why it Occupy Boston. Well, because, you know, you could ask me what I want, and I'll say I want the people who caused this mess to be taken out of their positions and or prosecuted. They should at least lose their job. I mean, I can tell you what I'd want. Right. You know, I mean, that's what I'd want. Now, will I go up? Will I go up to the government and protest it? No, because I feel personally, as a consumer, res- partially responsible for the entire collapse of the universe because I didn't educate myself and figure out what the heck was going on. <laughs> you know, but yeah, I mean, if I were if I were occupying Wall Street, I'd be like, I'll go to the table. I'll tell you exactly what I want. I want these people out, and I want you to get new people in. 
But we can't. But we can't tell a private company who they can hire and who they can't. That's not our I venue. They can't. I can if they're taking my tax dollars. I'm paying them. I can tell take, them the things I want. Not take, a lot of the private companies aren't taking our tax dollars. Oh yeah, but the ones who aren't, fine. We can't do anything about them. But all, but most of the ones who were responsible for the crash are taking our tax dollars and/or they're sticking it to us other ways. And as but we like talk- I said, Occupy Boston goes well beyond, and I'm sure these other Occupy movements do as well. Well beyond Wall Street, as I just said, it was it was anti-government. It was anti-troops. It was anti-Bank of America, and spe- specifically, it's it's just. An anti-anti <laughs> uh, movement at this point. With uh, just as I see it, as I've already said, no clear-cut vision or goal set for the Occupy movement. Just as far as I could see, I don't see a goal or an eventual resolution as to just what these people are ultimately looking to accomplish. I'm not saying they know. that. I, no, I think you're absolutely right on that. I think that that is, yeah, dead on. And listen, I don't think they know what they're looking for. I think that's the bigger problem. I'm sure we'll touch back on it again, and maybe I will uh, stop down to Occupy Boston and get a couple of... Uh, that would be interesting to find out at least what the kids in Boston are yeah, looking what are, for. What might, are the people something up. Yeah, I think having some live interviews would be really yeah, useful. Some interviews on here, so we'll see what we could do. So what's up next? Well, we got a little bit. I mean, you know, you and I were pretty excited about our tablets last week. There's a, as far as banks are concerned, there's some new news regarding tablets. Actually, it looks like uh, banks are really scrambling to try to create apps for all of these tablets um, because a lot of the phone apps that they were using are just not performing the way that they should on an on a tablet. And you know, they're scrambling now because you know everybody wants to be able to do their bank their banking from any device they have. That happens uh, generally speaking for any app. Um, the apps formatted for smartphones um, don't translate properly necessarily on the larger screens of a tablet. So it looks a little funkier. It doesn't quite work well. The particular banking apps that I'm currently using are still the generic website cell phone app um, you know, being used on a tablet. And I have no problem using it. Um, one of the articles that you had sent, somebody had specifically saying that uh, he got frustrated because he kept tapping on one particular button and, uh, you know, the wrong information was coming up or he was uh, deleting funds from his account instead of adding funds to his <laughs> account. I, I, do, I haven't quite run into that problem. Um, but, yes, obviously the uh, banking industry will come out with um, the apps that are formatted for tablets specifically so that they are easier to use. Absolutely. Yeah, but you would think they would have done this already. They've known the tablets are going to be on the market uh, a year ago. There's, it's a lot of work behind that. Keep, so, uh, you know keep, in mind, along, keep in mind along those lines, BaseNet doesn't even have a uh, Android or iPhone app yet. We had one and we pulled it down because it just wasn't working properly. Not quite as easy as you might think it is. Oh, no, no, well, yeah, I mean, banks can hire professionals to do this for them. Hey, and they and they have their app. Oh, I'm sorry, Holly. They have their apps. It's just tablets are relatively new. The iPad is the granddaddy now of all tablets, but the iPad is completely different because of the regulations that Apple has on getting apps onto any i product to begin with. So it's completely different writing an app for an i product than it is for Android. So. That's that's where the issue is. So it, it takes time, and, and they'll get there. They're coming out. Oh, no, I'm sure they will. Well, I, I think that's true. You know, and I talked to, I, I had the, you know, again, you know, I know I mention often that I'm in business school, and I had the great opportunity to spend some time with, uh, with Gidget Hall from MasterCard, and she's in charge of basically all of their, they actually run for most uh, financial institutions and a lot of other websites, the exchange, any exchange of money that happens digitally, they realize, you know, the world is going beyond tactile cards and that most money exchanges happen without writing a check, without giving cash. And they're actually going into company, countries where this stuff, stuff doesn't exist yet and making it possible. And she said a lot of times what you run up against in, in the is that these banking systems just aren't necessarily ready to switch over, you know, unlike a company that has huge amounts of R&D dollars, that's research and development, 
um, you know, banks are kind of low tech. They're sort of behind the times and they actually don't necessarily always have the infrastructure for the level of which we're trading now. You know, for, for things like paying bills, a lot of times it's the companies you pay bills to that are part of the problem. So sometimes with online banking, it goes into several areas which you wouldn't think would affect a website or an app at all. Yeah, so, and I mean, you know, along, along the lines of tech news, if you guys are wanting to move along, yes, no? We're always ready for tech news. I love that. I love, I love that about you guys. It's it's you know being a being devout followers of Leo Laporte that makes us so geeky. Um, uh, it, really sexy. The thing that bothers me is that we knew the technology was coming out a year ago. Tablets were coming out. Why didn't somebody start a year ago and do it? Make a generic bank app that all the banks use. That well, you can sign through account with. I mean, no, but see, just making a mountain out of a molehill. Now it's not that big of a deal. I take issue with this one particular person that was quoted in this article saying he had issues with using online banking on a tablet. I use it daily, if for nothing else other than checking my balances. Um, I have no issues whatsoever with it. As a matter of fact, because of a 10.1 inch screen as opposed to a 3.7 inch screen, even though it's the exact same app, it actually works better on a tablet because everything is bigger. It just doesn't look proper because it's not formatted specifically for a tablet. Right. So I take issue with that particular person saying he's having issues because, in my opinion, it's actually easier to, just by virtue of screen size, easier to use that same app on a tablet than it is on a cell phone. So it's, it's going to come. It's not a big deal. I mean, I think, and I think some of it is, as you said, kind of personal opinion. I mean, granted, that 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 article was from Reuters, which I think is, as far as news goes, probably one of the lingering, most dependable sources on the planet. But I mean, you know, you interview different people; they're going to tell you different things because they've got different banks, different tablets, different experiences. Of course. So, um, yeah, but, along, news. but in the tech news line, yeah, exactly. Um, I know we're all big. We all uh, use Google Plus. Maybe I don't use it as often as I should. <laughs> Um, but I'm a part of the problem, actually. Uh, the CNET actually reported this week that Google Plus wants to usher in the masses and that it's taking out television ads uh, during the Super Bowl to try to encourage people who aren't really as tech savvy to switch to Google Plus. Now, obviously, Google Plus isn't saying this, but their target seems to be Facebook. Right. This oh, seems to be a part of the battle royale for the web, as it may be. Google Plus cannot take down Facebook. Google Plus is not a Facebook killer. They're completely different animals. Um, you have all used Google Plus now and Facebook. And even if you don't use it much, as you don't, Holly, speaking of Google Plus, <laughs> you could still tell the differences between Google Plus and Facebook. They're not the same. You use them for different reasons. You use them differently. Ultimately, I don't think Google Plus is looking to become a Facebook. It's looking to become an alternative. And a year before Google Plus came out, when I was searching for an alternative for Facebook, I even said back then, I'm not looking for the Facebook killer. I don't necessarily care whether Facebook goes out of business or not. I'm looking for an alternative to Facebook. And I am now 95% on Google Plus as opposed to anything else. And anything I, all of my Facebook or Twitter posts primarily are just retransmitted from my Google Plus posts. I post on Google Plus and then it goes out to Facebook and Twitter. So I'm 95% on Google Plus and I'm extremely happy. I, because it meets all of my needs and I don't have to log into Facebook or Twitter to still post on Facebook and Twitter. Right. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, yeah, I, th I think eventually these things are all going to combine into some sort of mega something, and I think that's why Google is trying to stay in the game. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, Google, uh, sorry Facebook people, but Google owns the, the Googleverse, World. the Googleverse, um, as it's known, and the Internet is all about Google, uh, all of these Google products, it's, they're what, literally what Microsoft was in the late 90s. That's where Google is today. Um, Facebook is only one little tiny part of it. And if you, look, they don't buy them anyway. if you look at the total scheme of the Internet, 
Google, Facebook is to Google what Apple is to the PC world. Right. You know, the PC world is your 70, 80% of the computer market. And, you know, Apple is its small little 10, 15%. That's the difference between the Google verse and the Facebook world. So Google owns the internet and social media is just such a big part of it right now honestly who's to say that social media is not a fad you know you look you look back at the days of the initial the original instant messaging on america online it turned out to be a fad all of america online turned out to be a fad because america online with its with its uh, lockdown, its little lockdown world, wasn't the real internet. People then, as uh, they started using browsers and everything outside of AOL, they found out that there was a real internet out there. And Facebook is also that kind of enclosed little world where you do everything without within Facebook. And I, as well as other tech journalists, and I guess along these days I probably should start considering myself a tech journalist. <laughs> other tech journalists have said that a, uh, that Facebook is kind of like what AOL was. It's it's an enclosed little circle, and it's not the real deal. And I don't know that Facebook or even social media in general is going to be around in its present form for not even forever for a couple of years from now. I, I, I don't know that there's necessarily a future in it. The technology and the internet evolves. You know, go back five, ten years. The internet today is nothing what it was five, ten years from now. Google, as the huge multi-billion, tens of billion dollar company that it is, not that Facebook isn't worth a lot of money, but Google, the huge company that it is, could potentially be around 20 years from now, just like Microsoft is still around and a major player today, 25 years into the history of the Internet. I, I really think that Google will see that co same kind of longevity. I, Sorry, Mark, I just don't see that for Facebook. I don't see that kind of longevity. We, I we, still we see Facebook as a fad. two years anyway. Yeah, I still see Facebook as a fad. And that's well, my rant. You guys could have your show back after I hijacked it. <laughs> yeah, man, now you really have feelings about this. I knew we were getting into something. We were touching on your territory with this story here. Ed. This is a good one for you. Um, you know, I, I think you're right. I think it's it's just the beginning. You know, we don't know. With the Internet, Every it is a disruptive technology, as we call it in, uh, in uh, business terms, that is so fast-growing. It's, uh, it's almost impossible, but what we've learned from the IBMs of the world, the Microsofts of the world, and any other company that came into, Apple especially, that came into this game early, is the evolution and R&D dollars is the difference between growing or dying. And I know Google has definitely, from the get-go, woven into the fabric of what they are, is that they are you know, an internet company. They've never limited themselves to just a search engine or just an email. And, you know, they try things and let things fail and then they move on to other things because they are constantly reinvesting. And you talk about evolution. Look at Microsoft. Look at Microsoft Search Engine, which was origi originally MSN, yeah. evolved into Bing. Bing is now, even though the numbers aren't up with Google, Bing is the second most used search engine. MSN was a total failure, and MSN was around for 20 freaking years. Ever since the changeover to Bing, Bing is the number two search engine now. So it is all about evolution. We well, have to well, look at evolution for the fact that 25 years ago, you could, if you talked about computers, home PCs with terabytes of information, they would have told you it was impossible. I remember what 512 was. What 512 was what, what they told you would never get above that. Then went the gigabytes. Now we're at terabytes. Of course. I mean, yeah. so evolution is happening. It's happening in everything. And Google owns, right now, owns a phone market. I wouldn't be surprised if they buy Facebook in the next five years. 
Well, and you know, the that's actually not an an unmanageable forecast at this point. I mean, at this point, obviously, it wouldn't be viable. But I think it because I think it, right now Facebook is is very against that. But I but I think you know, as you mentioned, with evolution, you just don't know, and the internet evolves so quickly. There are some beautiful case studies written. I mean, you know, I use IBM, you know, because IBM, as you guys know, used to be the computer provider. And now is a, a sincerely just media, you know, just communications consulting. And there are just beautiful case studies on this that are written. And it's such a fascinating time to be in the business that we're in, you know, looking at this kind of stuff because everything moves so quickly. You just, you don't know what's next. And it could be anything. And everybody has a price. Zuckerberg is in his late 20s now. <laughs> Who's to say that by the time, less than 10 years from now, when he's in his mid-30s, He's not going to say, you know what, I've been in this game already now for almost 15, 20 years. I don't need this. I'm going to take the money and run. And he'll take whatever Google or anybody else offers him and retire at 35 years old. Yeah, exactly. You just never know. That's what I mean, you know. Also, Google always has its eyes open. It's it's ready when the opportunity. The thing that they have that other companies don't have is they've invested a lot of money in keeping your eyes open for the next big thing, taking opportunities when they come. They are they are not glued onto a track, which uh, which right now is really the difference, as I said, between growing or dying. I mean, I just you know. Google will buy any company. They'll try anything. If it doesn't work, they shut it down. Whether it comes through their own R&D or an acquired R&D, uh, just within the next couple of months, they're shutting down six of their own R&D products, one of which was Google Wave, which they actually shut down about a year ago, but they left it up for about a year, and they're finally killing it off officially over the next couple of months. Google is known for coming up with products or acquiring products, putting them out there, trying them out. If it doesn't work, they shut the project down. Yeah, you know, well, and I think if, if you guys are ready to sort of apply this on a bigger scale, looking at our Black Friday numbers, I think technology had a lot to do with that. Sure did, uh, yeah, and it, it is time to move on to the next topic. <laughs> you know, retail sales, they, they say they climbed 6.6% this year to an estimated $11.4 billion, according to ShopperTrack. So much for the Great Recession. Well, I mean, that's, that's a and, lot of money. Well, and to go ahead and tie this in, they said Black Friday online sales were up 24% on Black Friday and online sales on Thanksgiving Nearly forty percent, thirty nine point three. And we and we haven't come to uh, Black Monday or whatever they Cyber, call it yet, Cyber which is Monday. which is tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, well, you know, just just to tie it really full circle, that information came from IBM. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, technology is a big part of this. And I think one of the reasons the sales are up on Black Friday is, you know, I don't think we fully rebounded on that. I'm not sure we've seen the bottom of this economic downfall yet, but I'll tell you what, the slight rise that we had this year in spending, you know, in spending potential has led to people saying, hey, I don't have a lot of money, so I'm going on the day everything's on sale. You can get bargains out there though during the year without spending uh, without spending three hours online and and pepper spraying twenty people at Walmart though. I mean, <laughs> you know, we, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, along those lines, Tony Mazuko, you just left the door wide open for this, Fred. Tony Mazuko on our new show Viewpoint, which we recorded a couple of days ago, just made mention to that. He says, you know what? And I'm going to paraphrase Tony. This was a great line. He says, you know what? Do I need to get up at 3 a.m., run to Walmart to get that $199 TV, stand in line for six hours in the freezing weather to buy a TV for $199. He said, no, I don't. I'll pay $399 for that TV and order it from the convenience of sitting in my own home. <laughs> there you go. Uh, that, that's perfect. Well, the example, the prime example of that is we went out and bought a 55-inch big screen TV. Yes, people, we have a big screen. And we found it on sale at Best Buy. And the TV we wanted wasn't available. They had a good price on, on another. We went and got the one we got for the price we wanted to pay. I'd have to stand in line at 3 o'clock in the morning to go do that. It is what it is. 
Oh man, I do not like standing online. I, I mean, I love online shopping. Actually, I we went on Saturday. My uh, my in law, my sister in law, my mother in law, and I, and that was even a little too much shopping for me. My sister and mother in law and I were all tapped out within like forty five minutes. I don't have what it takes, man. There are some people who are super shoppers. I'm not that girl. See, I insist on seeing a product in person. So I will go to a brick and mortar store to browse and to look and to compare models and whatnot. Nine times out of 10 when I buy, unless I absolutely just want to walk out of the store with it at that particular moment, I'll then eventually buy the product online. I just like holding something in my hand and everything in the store, and then down the road when I'm ready to buy, I'll order it online. But that's I, not I did that. online for six hours at Walmart either. No, I did that with my tablet. I looked at several different models in the store. I looked and held and actually played with, used the actual tablet that I eventually bought in a Best Buy and made my comparisons, made up my mind, and then when I was ready to drop the dime, I did it online and I ordered the tablet that way. But see, the problem with that is that's the reason brick and mortar stores are dying. You're not going to have a place to test things out if you don't buy stuff at the places where you're allowed to test them. Best Buy is having, I mean, they outlasted all their competitors, but they're having a lot of trouble because people do that. No, they agreed. Our, our library is going to last forever with eBooks now. Best Buy? No, libraries. Our library is going to last forever with eBooks. You know, oh, I mean, even libraries themselves now offer eBooks. You know, I could go to the Boston Library online, and I've done it, and I download eBooks from the Boston Library online to oh, now my tablet or my Nook when I had it. So are, are brick and mortar libraries even eventually going to be able to sustain? They, prob they probably will because people still like to go into the reference. But I mean, as far as brick and mortar stores, they're still going to become places that that there's going to be one around because they know there are still the people that like to go in and, and, and see the item and see what's going on physically. You, you can't get a view online of, of the actual feel of something. No, you want to hold it in your hands. And, that, yeah, and that's part of the, um, of the thing. Like when I, when I bought the, uh, the phone I have, I, even though I bought it the way I bought it, I still went into the store, got the phone, and looked at it and held it. And said, yeah. okay, this is what I'm dealing with. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys, but the problem that both of you, I don't believe that both of what either of you are saying is viable because guess what? Neither of you spent any money in that store where you handled that item. Those stores are going under, and it's your fault. Well, I spent money in that what? store, just not on the phone. Oh, yeah, okay, so you bought something for $20 instead of something that cost you hundreds of dollars? Well, I bought something that cost $800 rather than something that cost me 100 Oh, well, there you go. But, I mean, okay. No, ab absolutely, I, I'll admit to that. The, the last purchase I made at Best Buy was a $60 purchase as opposed to a $300 purchase. But yeah, what I, mean, I like I'm about sorry, the online... You guys like it, to handle things in person. The profit margins aren't there. And you know at the end of the day, every company exists for one reason and one reason only. Other, I mean, nobody's operating for free. We, none of us would have jobs. So if you're not buying stuff, they're not making a profit. There's no reason for them to keep that brick and mortar store. And as you guys talked about, the internet is limitless now. There may be ways to have a very close experience online and never have to go into a brick and mortar store in our future. So what's what's the answer? Do you shut down the internet or do you shut down brick and mortar stores? Or, mortar or, or are they both going to be able to uh, exist side by side? I'm going to go ahead and tell you that the vortex is already open on this one and the internet has won. Oh, the internet's going to win out. Yeah, I mean, there's no, you you know, you say it as though we're making a choice. We've already chosen. All of us have agreed we've already chosen. But there's also something else, that there are stores that are going to still go, because I can now go on the Internet, and I can order things from stores that I wouldn't normally have a chance to order from. That's because true. Because they're able to offer off the Internet to people all over the world. An example is a blower motor for my wife's car. The dealer price on it is almost $700. I picked it up online through eBay Motors from a guy in, I think it's Miami. For three hundred fifty dollars, so he's able to sell me that piece, and his store now made three hundred fifty dollars on the piece. And, and also, and also currently, and it probably will change over the next couple of years because they keep trying to force feed the legisl legislation through. There is no sales tax currently on internet sales. Like I said, that probably is going to change. But speaking as of today, in November of 2011, there is no sales tax via the internet. So there's another way to save. 
Exactly. And, you know, um, the, you know, CNET did a wonderful piece on this years ago, um, basically chronicling how we're all going to be self-selecting and how there's going to be a lot of opportunity for smaller players. But a lot of these bigger players are going to go away because some of the economies of scale are going to die out with those brick and mortar stores. Now, whether or not we see that happen, we'll see. But they were looking at it from more of a news provider perspective. I would be interested to see how that plays out in hard goods. Speaking no, yeah. of hard goods. Yeah, and getting back to uh, just before uh, before we get too far off the subject, getting back to Black Friday, Fred had just touched on it that there was some violence over Black Friday as well. There's a lot of violence, and there was a uh, a, a lady. We all we've all heard about the lady who uh, who um, uh, right. who well the word isn't really mace who pepper sprayed 20 people, including children, to buy an Xbox 360 for for, uh, for half price. The thing that bothers me about that is that she was able to make the purchase and go home with the piece. But nobody at Walmart stopped her. Let's play the clip. I asked the cops why, uh, how she was able to actually pepper spray a group of people and then walk out of the store. Well, apparently there was so much mayhem after she pepper sprayed even children inside the store trying to get to this Xbox 360 uh, that they didn't know who did what. And she was able to get to the register. She was able to check out and get the Xbox 360 at half price. It's what she really wanted. But uh, 20 people were injured, uh, what, sh what uh, police are calling shopper's rage, when uh, she went in and tried to get this uh, Xbox 360, and there was apparently a huge scrum in the store, people scrambling to try and get the, this merchandise, and uh, she was able to ward off uh, those uh, competitive shoppers and get uh, exactly what she wanted. And, you know, nobody stopped this woman from buying. The we should say that she has since uh, turned herself in. Yeah, okay. But I, it, it, that's not my issue. My issue is, you know, is that the, pe the, the 20 people were assaulted. I hope she's going to be charged with aggravated assault on 20 people. And Walmart should be held partially culpable because nobody stopped them. They did not take any action against this woman in the store and they allowed her to complete the sale. So they made their profit and they got out. Ugh. I don't know how I feel about that, but I don't think I have any solid argument for it, man. I mean, they create the hysteria around this. I mean, you've seen the ads for Walmart Black Friday. And actually, I have to say, I thought the Target ads this year were awesome for Black Friday with the with the crazy lady working out because that's what you think of when you think of Black Friday. But, you know, I, I, I really want to make an argument for that, Fred, but I just, I can't, man. You know, they create the hysteria. They better be able to manage it. And people die every year. These and stores they can't manage it, so they should be held culpable for it. Yeah, and you know, you know the. I mean, in this, you know, the article that we're looking at came also from Reuters, and uh, you know, they talk about how. I mean, there was there was an incident in North Carolina where you know off-duty officers had to use pepper spray to actually subdue people because they were getting out of control. Somebody got robbed outside of a Walmart in California. I mean, this is just it. It's just widespread nonsense. Again, especially as what we just talked about, you can buy this stuff online. I mean, look, I have a set of uh, of outlet stores, 100 outlet stores in a place here in Tannersville, Pennsylvania, about five miles from my house, where on Black Friday, don't drive on the street. You can't get down the road. There's that many cars coming in from New York, New Jersey, parts of Pennsylvania, because the sales tax in Pennsylvania is cheaper than New York and New Jersey. And these people are just mobbing the streets all night long. And, and the malls are still packed up here. It's crazy, and there's violence going on up here as well. I mean, like you said, people getting robbed. I mean, why? I mean, I'll wait, and and I'll go pay the extra money, like Ed said, and I'll. I don't need to be going out, and, and, and I won't do that. I've done it once, never again. Yeah, I just I don't think it's. I mean, it's just not worth it, guys. If it's your life or your or your item, just you know, <laughs> it's not worth fighting someone else for. for and the thing that gets me, this thing. woman walked into the store with pepper spray, so she it was the first degree assault, as far as I'm concerned. You know, because otherwise it'd be like in the bottom of your purse. Right. Why? Well, I mean, yeah. You know, what is she walking in? If these people get in my way, I'm gonna spray them. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's, I mean, that's what it seems like, I mean, right? I, I, not for nothing, but I hope this woman does jail time. I really do. Well, you know, and I, I hope, I'm, and I I'm, hope Walmart gets sued. In Big my time. heart, hearts, I'm praying that there's some gag order on her because of this and that this was, like, self-defense from other violent customers. So, like, she felt the need to carry her pepper spray because people were being so violent. But I don't know, man. I just think the whole thing is ridiculous. Well, as, as Fred's aware, 
I, I don't want to use the word almost because that's a little too general, but almost everybody in California carries a form of pepper spray anyway. It's just easy to get the, uh, the to take the class and to get the permit and everything and to carry pepper spray, and it's just so widespread out there. Like I said, almost everybody carries it anyway. And the thing that gets me is pepper spray started out as being something that up until about three years ago was illegal to carry unless you were a letter carrier to postal service or a meter reader for gas and electric companies and the gas and electric companies had to get it from the postal service that's how controlled it was up until about three or four years ago i just now, like to say for the record that uh, you didn't see a lot of this happening in texas because everybody carries handguns there Carry guns <laughs> in texas who, who needs to bother with pepper spray when you got a gun Exactly. Oh, well. So you notice people people are less prone to fight when everybody's packing heat. I don't know how I feel about that one way or the other, but I'm just telling you that's how You it don't is. hear about people people shooting each other online. You hear them pepper spraying. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. And most well, people so, in Texas know what they're doing. It's true. Well, because you, you do have to take a concealed carry, carry class. So, right. You know, but, the, but that also means you don't mess around because you get shot no matter where you go. But the, uh, no, you don't. That doesn't actually happen very often when everybody's carrying because you pull, they pull. Um, but anyway, sorry, moving right along. So the, uh, so then once you buy these things, you take them home and, uh, this is something you still have to buy in person. Uh, they've been talking about the Chevy Volt. Oh, come on. Sustainability people out there. You know, you think you find the answer and consumer reports, uh, basically has been reporting that the national highway traffic safety administration has opened a formal, uh, investigation into the Chevy Volt because apparently it catch it burst the flames. Yeah. You didn't, you didn't get one, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't get I one. Remember, I remember another car that used to catch up fire. We got hit in the rear end. You know, the Pinto. Ford Pinto. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but poor GM, man. Because you know, I have friends who are who are not American car buyers who were so excited about the Chevy Volt because it was just the most promising thing in sustainable driving. And now this. I mean, GM just cannot catch a break. Eh, they'll get the bugs worked out. They'll get it worked out, and they'll, uh, I'm waiting for them to get it worked out. I like to, I like to see more electrical car, more electric cars being sent out. I like to see the stuff going. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see other options come out too, because I, I, I'm sort of holding off. I, I mean, obviously, I'm getting the most sustainable car I can within my means. You know, I drive a Subaru with lots of mile, you know, that gets lots of miles per gallon. But you know, I, 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 you know, I just keep waiting on what's the right answer because you know they really haven't. The electric car isn't really there yet, and that's going to be a huge disruption. And, you know, I mean, the, the economies of scale on this are ridiculous. Can you imagine them putting in these jumbo plugs at every gas station? I think we still just need a car like in the second Back to the Future movie where you could just stuff anything down into the engine and it'll run. Well, the military, the military has almost has those. There are multi-fuel vehicles they, that they can run on almost anything. Mm-hmm. And you can put in you can put in uh, diesel fuel, gasoline, uh, into the same into the same gas tank with minor modifications and run the vehicle right. forever. So the technology does exist, and the thing is that all this technology does exist. I mean, we have we have we... ethanol burning cars, but no ethanol gas stations around the area. Right. Where did you find this? I can't find this anywhere online about the military multi fuel vehicles. Those are all those are all they, the uh, military deuce and a half, the uh, six buys. What are they call? They multi, they, it's called a deuce and a half. It's a, it's a military truck. In an emergency, it can run. It can run diesel fuel. It can run bunker C uh, heating oil. It can be run on gasoline in an emergency. They're multi fuel vehicles. They, they've had those for 20 years. Uh, they, they don't they don't last long on gasoline, but it can be done. I want to talk more about that maybe some other time. I'm interested in that because I I think if that were a viable option, we would have heard more. Oh, about Oh, Holly's it. buying a deuce and a half. No, 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 no. But I think I want to know more about it. I, I, what I am saying is I have not heard anything about that. And I feel it, like it, Holly, it's something that. you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to run gasoline and diesel fuel together. But the engines <laughs> no, can't. No, they can run on it. It's just very difficult. They're made to run on diesel fuel or what they call bunker C, which is heating oil. But in an emergency, you can 
put gasoline into the tank and not ruin the engine until you get you can get filled up again. Right, and just like the more the more common version of almost any diesel car or truck engine, which is supposed to run on diesel fuel, could also burn home heating oil. So right. you Same know, thing. if you just happen to be out of gas, but you happen to have uh, you know a home heating tank that you could tap into. Well, you could put enough fuel into your car then or truck to be able to drive to the gas station to get regular diesel fuel. And the only reason, the only reason that comes about is because of the fact that when the military, the vehicle may not be anywhere near a, uh, a fueling depot. That's how they wound up doing that one. All right. Not recommended, but, you know. So what's next? Well, no, I mean, we still, they're, still, they're still doing the investigation, or a, a quasi-investigation to the, th uh, the, uh, de the accidental death 30 years ago of Natalie Wood. And, like like everybody said, the uh, the latest is that there's really, you know, they're investigating it, but they and they're taking uh, testimony now. The captain of the boat, where Natalie Wood spent uh, the last moments of her life, was extremely drunk during the critical moments before and after she went missing. This, according to the captain himself, Dennis Dar Davern, told TMZ Live that he drank a lot of scotch and wine in the hours leading up to Natalie's disappearance. And that puts him into a problem with maritime law because under maritime law, he is ultimately responsible for everything that goes on board that boat, whether you like it or not. That's why people like Hazel, like Captain Hazelwood, got uh, got nailed for the uh, Exxon Valdez issue several years ago because he's the captain, and whatever goes on in that vessel, he is ultimately responsible for, for by. Um, but, you know, again, the last person to see Natalie alive was Robert Wagner, and he's not being charged with statute of limitations or over most of those crimes anyway, unless he confesses. So. Yeah, with, with sources in the L.A. County District's office, uh, district attorney's offices are uh, literally just scratching their heads over this investigation because they say that there's really no way that the DA is going to be able to prosecute Robert Wagner or anyone else. Um, they they continue to say that Robert Wagner isn't a suspect, but as Fred said, that he's is the last person apparently to have seen Natalie alive. So obviously he's the target of the probe. Um, however, under California law, um, getting some of this information from uh, well, some's from TMZ, some's from CNN. Even if Wagner was accidentally pushed Natalie into the water, he couldn't be charged with involuntary manslaughter because there's a statute of limitations of three years on that crime. So 27 years ago or so, he would have had to have been charged. Yeah, there, there's uh, and the, the same thing with voluntary manslaughter, because uh, that also has a statute of limitations of three years. And then as Fred just said, uh, for um, second-degree murder, there's a six-year statute of limitations. So that leaves what first-degree murder, which, of course, as everybody knows, anybody that's graduated even elementary school knows that there's no statute of limitations on first-degree murder. But outside of some bizarre confession, there's no witnesses, there's no facts behind anybody that committed first-degree murder. Thus, there's just no case here. Well, all of this comes out of, of a book written by a guy named Marty Rowley, the author of the book that triggered the cops to reopen the investigation to Wood's death, performed a forensic test on down coats. Now, uh, Natalie Wood was wearing a red down jacket when authorities discovered her body 30 years ago, and her wardrobe could have proved that she floated in the dark after for hours while Robert Wagner allegedly stalled rescue efforts. But, you know, it says that performing forensic tests on coats similar to Natalie's, which prove the down jacket acts like a life preserver in the water if it will not sink but instead remains floating. Ruley's finding completely contradicts the opinion of the coroner of a case who insisted that the jacket would have sapped uh, Natalie's strength to weigh her down to the ocean. So you got conflicting reports even 30 years later. Nobody's ever really going to find the answer on this. Now, at the time, 30 years ago, uh, yourself, Fred, and me were living out there in the L.A. area. And so we're familiar with the whole Southern California locale. Where do you remember where the this took place? Was this Marina del Rey? Was this uh, out around? Uh, Cat it was, uh, uh, Natalie's Wood was discovered in the ocean off of Catalina. Off of Catalina. And uh, there's a said the captain claimed Wagner instructed the crew not to call the Coast Guard to aid in search and rescue efforts once they realized Natalie had gone missing. So a lot of what he did is suspect. And I said it back then that you know what he's doing is silly and stupid if he's not involved. But you don't know what his reasoning was, and none of us were there. 
So there are, there are allegations she may have fallen overboard trying to get into a boat for whatever reason. Uh, you know, nobody really knows what's happened. We're not going to know. But there's a lot of things that 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 people are are you know questioning the actions of what's going on. But you know, had the Coast Guard gotten there early, could she have been found early? We don't know. We don't know if she drowned right away. But there's, a, I was out there, and I, I always said that what, what, what R.J. did was bad. What he did was silly. What he did was stupid. But maybe he, he did what he did for whatever reasons he did. Right, and we don't know what he did or what he didn't do. And I don't, I don't believe you ever met him. Um, luckily, I could say I had the honor of meeting him in passing one time. He was, he was part of a show called Heart to Heart. That's right. Um. It was co-host with or the co-star with uh, Jill, Jill St. John. Jill St. John, and uh, they were shooting an episode in Griffith Park, just next to the Griffith Park Zoo, uh, in the Los Feliz section of Los Angeles, and I was able to get the opportunity to meet him on the location of that set, and. Just as you just referred to him as R.J., when the person who was going to do the introductions for me said, "Well." If we happen to stumble upon him and you get to meet him, he says, you just shake his hand and call him RJ. He says, all of Robert Wagner's friends call him RJ, and that's just how you refer to him. So my memory of him is uh, walking up to this big tall guy, which he was or is, and uh, shaking his hand and saying, hey, RJ, nice to meet you. And we just had, you know, exchange pleasantries. It it was actually at the, the catering truck. And, uh, you know, uh, met him over a hot dog or something. Uh, But he was a very personable guy. Um, Myself, like you did, Fred, working in Hollywood, and we've worked around celebrities in our prior life. Um, Nine out of ten of these people are phenomenally friendly people, more down to earth than the general public would ever realize that these people are. You get that one out of ten that isn't, but nine out of ten are. And Robert Wagner was one uh, from my little brief interlude with him, a very personable guy. And um, now he's in his 80s, and at this point in his life, he certainly doesn't need this crap 30 years later. So I hope it all works out for him. Oh, yeah. Well, moving from uh, Hollywood royalty into real royalty, it seems that uh, the Prince of uh, England had a little bit of work on his hands this weekend. Um, and actually, this also involves water and uh, actually a sunken cargo carrier. Um, it appears that there were five missing crew members from um, from a search and rescue mission off the co- coast of Wales. And uh, and they actually sent in, uh, the prince was the co-pilot of the first rescue helicopter on the scene. Well, they had, uh, sent him, they sent his unit, they sent the helicopter he was assigned to. Yes, yes, and he was the he just was the first one on the scene, which is kind of cool, um, because you know, I mean, I, I'm sure in history I saw the King's Speech, you know, that that there have been royals who have been put to work in uh, in previous generations, but as we've talked about before, it's nice to see them working, getting out there with the regular man, being a but part the, of the, the thing that bothers me is that they're saying that Prince William did it when the crew. Did it right? He's part of the, he's part of the royal a, a royal navy a royal air force crew that, that performed the rescue. They're not naming anybody else by name. And, well, that, and he didn't do it as the prince of way uh, as the prince. He did it as whatever his rank is. And that's he actually did it as part untrue. Of that crew. That's actually untrue. On the BBC article that I'm reading, he's only one of the people who's mentioned. They mentioned the coast guard manager. They mentioned. Oh, the good. Officer. That's that's fine. I wasn't aware of that. I, I didn't read that. Yeah, I mean, he is a passing. Remember. He is a passing mention in the article, but it's just really interesting. You know What's that he. The headline, of the, article? the headline of the article was "Hunt for Five Missing Crew of Sunken Swanland Halts." Prince, you know. No, it doesn't say no, anything doesn't about say Prince. That. It doesn't say anything about the Prince of Wales. I I was reading the article and then found out about him. They're actually talking about how this you know this boat sank and. Well, he's, he's not the Prince of Wales. That's his father. That's the Prince of Wales. Prince, 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 Prince. Yeah, no, he's not. He's not. I mean, he's he's barely mentioned in the article. But I think it's really cool that you know I, while the, obviously this sort of thing happens every day. Yeah, and, think, and it's a job anyway. But still, yeah, it is cool. So, yeah, and speaking about his wife, the uh, well, she's not a princess because the queen wouldn't allow her to be called a princess, but Catherine, uh, Kate, 
old Kate there, uh, she is either pregnant or wants to get pregnant, according to some tabloids I just saw in the supermarket. Yeah, um, Actually, well, I, we, we I just found too, some she is. Yeah, ju well, I just found some similar articles, although everybody says it's rumored and speculated and expected. that the, They expect that they'll announce it sometime soon. Nobody has it for certain. They haven't come out and announced it yet. Yeah, right. Well, okay, I'm uh, reading something here from Week World News, and it says that uh, London, just five days into her marriage with Prince William, Kate Middleton announced that she is pregnant. Kate is pregnant with Prince William's first child. The announcement was made by Kate with her friend Victoria Beckham standing at her side. So I guess it is, or is it, you know, we'll have to go by what they, whatever they tell us, but. All right, so we'll wait and see. But anyway, I just wanted to toss that in since you were talking about her husband. So what else we have? Well, uh, I mean, along Hollywood news, you guys still have a lot of time to catch up on the Twilight series because they still rack up number one for We time. told you last week we're not going to waste our time catching up on the Twilight series. But uh, since you, know, you want to talk about it, feel free to talk oh, about Ed, it. You had to bring it in. You know, Ed, it is a joke. <laughs> I know, but I'm still not going to watch it. I know, but it's a lot funnier. It's a lot funnier because you guys uh, protest so loudly. Um, it, you know, it wouldn't be funny for if me. If we didn't make such it. a big stink about it, there wouldn't be a joke behind it, would there? Precisely. Right? If we watched it, we um, wouldn't make a big stink about it. I might like it if I watched it. That's the problem. Yeah, that would be really scary. See, that's that's why the protesting, uh, hence Shakespeare. But, uh, but yeah, no, they... Uh, it was number one this weekend? They were. They collected $42 million in ticket sales over the weekend, and the Muppets were uh, as close behind them as anyone could be with $29.5 million. This is me. I thought the Muppets would probably blow it away. No. I mean, I love the Muppets, but they don't have the, the crazy fan power that... I mean, you know, the, everybody loves the Muppets. They have a strong base. You know, they've been putting out movies for, what, 40, 30, 30 years now, you know, I mean, that's a strong franchise, but it doesn't have the right now hot tween, I will see that movie six times in the theater mania that Twilight has, you know, people, <laughs> and also no one takes their shirts off as far as I know in the Muppet films, and I'm sure that's Oh, uh, we don't see Miss Piggy topless? Hey, I know you boys oh, are looking boy. forward to that. <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not sure if this is related or similar, but, uh, but God bless Miley Cyrus. She cannot catch a break. That poor girl, just every time she sticks her foot in her mouth, there's a camera there to catch it. And at her birthday party this weekend, Kelly Osborne apparently made a joke and gave her a Bob Marley cake. And Miley Cyrus replied by saying, you know you're a stoner when your friends make you a Bob Miley cake. <laughs> and then she followed that, God bless her, by saying, you know you smoke way too much effing weed. <laughs> Oh, well. To which, of course, to which, of course, you know. Osborne so we see the next Lindsay Lohan there, huh? Oh, uh, God. Well, you yeah, know, well. Kelly Osborne yeah. tries to bail her out and says, well, you were caught smoking salvia, which apparently is legal, but it also has hallucinogenic effects. And, you know, she's, you know, Osborne keeps trying to protect her, saying, hey, she's not a pothead. It was a joke. But, I mean, it just seems like she, she just cannot catch a break. It's like any time something moderately subversive happens to her, there are a bajillion cameras. Oh, what? Where's the old studio system when you need it? That's right. Bring Louis B. back. That's oh. Now, there were, there were all kinds of problems with that. Too. You, you're telling me you want another Judy Garland, huh? I'll, I'll bite, Holly. Yes, I would love to see, see the studio system come back. I, and I'll speak for Fred, are, are huge, huge fans. I idolize Louis B. Mayer. Louis yeah. B. Mayer was loved and despised at the same time in Hollywood. Uh, just read his book, The Lion of Hollywood. Uh, oh, or yeah, the yeah. book read about him, The Lion of Hollywood. Himself. But I idolize, and I try, when I grow up, I want to be Louis B. Mayer. Um, I just <laughs> think that we need the, Holly, the studio system back again. I don't know, man. I think the studio system was just wrought with, with problems. Nobody, I mean, think about how many people had pill addictions and all these under-the-table problems. I think having the camera around, if anything, keeps people more more honest and let's be fair you want louis v mayer back he ran he started his career running a burlesque i mean that's not no, that, that what well, we're, we're talking about the 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 idea that if you go out and you get arrested 
and you're out doing drugs, you lose your job in, in, in Hollywood as a celebrity because you're making the studio look bad. And that's the idea. They didn't know that Rock Hudson was gay for years or Robert Reed was gay for years because the studio didn't allow it to happen. They created the image of the Protected other celebrities. Them. Protected them? They, stuff that they, they completely squashed their, their ability to be a person. No, no, but they, you wouldn't see the Lindsay Lohans going out getting arrested. Every no, five Holly, years. back in those oh, days, yeah. it was protected them. Their careers would have been over instantly if it turned out that they were gay. Uh, we're talking a completely different time frame than what we're at now. Back then, they were being protected That's by not right. coming what? out. Listen, I'm not saying that there wasn't all kinds of terrible, terrible dark violence, and obviously you guys would know better than me, but I but my, I believe ev it is always darkest before the dawn when it comes to issues like this, and squelching it and putting it under things and making people, forcing people to hide it and having no icons, to to I, for younger kids to idolize to look up to there being no there being no um, idols in that facility I, I I don't believe in this I think so, all the studio system does so is create a dark let, space for these things to happen so, so they can let them grow and get worse girls and, worse. Go out and get pregnant through drugs and and alcohol well, that what's happening open well, your just, eyes but that's who they're idolizing. No, just, all of that was okay, happening. If it's okay no, for them, it's okay that's for That's not me. what I'm saying. You know that's exactly the opposite of what I'm saying because my mother used to say, and I was an awesome kid, regardless of what you, regardless of what I became later. <laughs> I was an awesome kid. I didn't, I didn't even drink until I was 25. I never got in trouble. I had straight A's in high school. I went to a great college. And the reason was my mother sat me down when I was really young, and she said there are two ways to learn things. You can see other people go through trouble or you can do it yourself. So I learned from other people's mistakes. And yeah, do you don't have if you don't enjoy the Lindsay Lohan news and I am one of the people who do not, you do not have to watch it. But if you put things in the dark and allow them to fester and allow them to happen unchecked and, and allow them to have no repercussions in the public eye, you are just asking for more trouble. That's why so many terrible things had, they are coming to light now that happened during that era because they were hidden. But no, what if you? But what if you have a twelve-ish year old daughter who idolizes Lindsay Lohan? How is that good? And how is that a good impression on your twelve-year-old daughter? If you have a twelve-ish year old daughter who idolizes Lindsay Lohan, you're all right. Maybe not twelve, because Lindsay yeah. Lohan now, I guess, is pushing thirty. But you know what I mean. Let's okay. let's say Lindsay Lohan in her for early wild days when she was only nineteen or something. Okay, you know that the twelve, thirteen-year-old girls idolized her back at that point. No, how is I that a good idolization? The difference between you and me is that I was young back then, and we all thought she was super gross and pitiful, and no okay. one wanted to end up like Lindsay Lohan. That was you. Okay. There's a lot of people that don't do that because they saw her and they they see p they see the 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 people out there see these people being treated specially because of the fact that they don't have to serve the time and under the stu and i'm not saying the entire studio system not what we're talking about we're talking about the that studio system where about, you did, where you, where this was not accepted behavior from any celebrity if you were arrested for doing drugs, you were out, you, you lost your job. You had to live your lifestyle as clean as possible to set a good image for the uh, studio. Nobody really cared. I mean, there's a lot of things that happened out there. Where they, I mean, there's things that, said that were good and bad about it. But we're talking about the image of, of, of celebrities that are out there. They're getting away with, they're getting away with, with speed. They say, I'm so-and-so, I can do what I want. I mean, come on, that's crazy. They don't have to. They, they report in for a year in jail and get 18 hours in jail, and it's okay. This girl well, hasn't I, spent time in jail yet. She's doing I, more community you, service. Yeah, but you just totally contradicted yourself because you you said in the same sentence that there were no repercussions. That that all they had to do back then was clean up their life and all this stuff about people not serving their jail time. All that stuff was happening then. And Ed basically just said he does want to be Louis V. Mayer. He wants to go back to exactly. No, I want to go back to where if you got caught doing this, you lost your contract with the studio. That didn't happen all the time, though. No, you have to understand that there was a celebrity that was bigger than the studio even back then. They, no, put, they put so much money into these stars, they wouldn't just let them fall. You should tell her a story about a guy with a horse. <laughs> <laughs> next show. What's the next topic? Uh, we're, I, I mean, I think we're we're pretty tapped out in the in the long run here. I think we've got. I think we've been through all of our topics and then some. 
except for one obituary, which... That brings I'll... us to the end? Okay, well, before we get to the obituary, then, why don't we have this week's exciting adventure of Holly and the Lobster Tales with Holly and the Lobster. Guys? What have you got for me this week, Larry? First one I have is each king in a deck of cards represents a great king. Okay, the spades is King David. Clubs is Alexander the Great. Hearts is Charlemagne. Diamonds is Julius Caesar. Only two people signed the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, John Hancock and Charles Thompson. Most of the rest signed on August 2nd. But the last signature wasn't added until five years later. San Francisco cable cars are the only mobile are the only are the only mobile national monuments. And the last one is Tom Sawyer is the first novel ever written on a typewriter. So I find that interesting. I'm sorry. I, I like those four. Well, here's my question though. How I've seen a King of Spades, and it does not seem very era appropriate for King David. Good well, point. I'm sure the card pictures have changed. Yeah. Most definitely, they have to have, right? Can we? Get, I wonder if we could look up some old photos, if we could post them on Basenet or something. Some old photos of yeah. cards. Paris and side by side photos. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And then the uh, Declaration of Independence, the uh, big historical nut that I am. Um, I'm going to look into that. I wasn't quite aware of that. And well, that makes maybe, sense they weren't all there. No, I mean, it certainly makes sense. I I kind of find it hard to believe that the last signature wasn't added until five years later, though. I'm uh, not disputing the facts, but I just don't have the facts. And then the San Francisco cable car, I would obviously have no problem believing that. Maybe we should have Jessica look into that, about them being a mobile national monument. The only one. The only one. I, you know, Ed, since you're such a big history buff, I heard John Hancock was like a total jerk. Is that true? John what? Hancock? Yeah, John Hancock wasn't necessarily liked. Uh, but I'll tell you, along those, in that time period, uh, being now a resident of Quincy, Massachusetts, <laughs> the home of the president, um, John Adams, Sr., the first John Adams, was hey. the, no, no, he was the Jerry Ford of his time. He was a short, stocky, not that Jerry Ford was short and stocky, because remember, he was a Michigan football player, but John Adams was a short, stocky, fumbling, bumbling, kind of a fool kind of a guy. I've read a lot of accounts where John Adams would just stumble over his own two feet and everything. So John Adams was kind of the buffoon of his time. <laughs> Just a little interesting fact. Little and interesting fact. and uh, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and their respective wives are both buried in a tomb in the church that stands in the middle of Quincy Center in Quincy, Massachusetts. And uh, you could go pay your respects at their grave. Um, and the... Uh, the nickname of Quincy, Massachusetts is the City of Presidents. That's their motto type thing. And the last little known fact, since we're talking about Quincy and the, the Adamses, is you will hear historical references of the Adams family, the real Adams family, not the television Adams family. You'll, you'll hear references of the Adams family being from Braintree. Well, Braintree was the entire area of what is now Braintree and Quincy, Massachusetts. The Adamses came from what is currently modern-day Quincy, which is more or less northern Braintree. After they would, had all passed and everything, they decided to incorporate that northern Braintree area of Quincy as a separate city in like honor of the Adams family, and they called that section Quincy. So that's how now we have the city of Braintree and the city of Quincy. But the city of Quincy is actually where the Adamses were from and are current and are buried. And that's modern day Quincy. And, okay, I lied. There is one more little fact. It's <laughs> not Quincy. Q-U-I-N-C-Y uh, phonetically. It's, it's Quincy with the Z. And it goes back to 
actual references that they have from the Adams family and everything from back then, it was pronounced Quincy, not Quincy. Uh, so I've even gotten a habit of since I've moved here almost four years ago now, I call it Quincy. That's how it's actually pronounced. Wow. Yeah, I was actually, when you mentioned, uh, you know, I, I looked up uh, John Hancock and he was married to Dorothy Quincy. Uh, who became Dorothy Quincy Hancock and later Dorothy Quincy Hancock Scott, God bless her. Um, and, you know, they, they had a pretty traumatizing life there in the Boston area, and she actually ended up uh, living out her final years at 4 Federal Street in Boston. So she went from, you know, the Quincy Homestead there in Quincy, Mass., Quincy, and uh, and then, you know, and then to New Hampshire and then to Beacon Street and then to Boston. So, I mean, that's a lot of American history right there where you are, Ed. There you go. And Abigail Adams, the wife of... John Adams, the senior, was born in Weymouth, Mass., the next town over, right over the river from Quincy. Yeah, remember, at that time, they didn't travel that far either. No, they didn't. Boston. So, you know, I mean, no, so, no, what I'm saying, having one person born in Massachusetts and having both of them born it makes a lot of sense for that sure. time frame. And the old section of Boston, uh, you know, the old original peninsula of Boston, is eight miles door to door from downtown Quincy to downtown Boston. So. You know, even in that time, when they went down the old route from Quincy to Boston, or Braintree like at the time, Boston, you know, it was only eight miles, so it didn't take them a heck of a long time. So, yeah, they, they stayed close to home. Yeah, that's actually, that's you really know, they, got, they got along without electricity, they got along without the internet. And... <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, who did we lose this week, uh, Holly? Well, Fred? Well, I mean, uh, Holly sent a um, a uh, a link to, uh, to the Washington Post saying that Lynn Margulies, leading evolutionary biologist, died in '73. It's very interesting. She was a rebel within the realm of science who determined uh, who 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 determined advocacy of your ideas about new how new species arose, helped change evolutionary biology. She died November 22nd at her home in Amherst. Um, <laughs> She was a Amherst, uh, as in Massachusetts. As in Massachusetts. Again, Massachusetts. Right down the road a piece. Mar hey, it looks like uh, Massachusetts wins the show today. Doctor Margulies was best known for demonstrating a theory of biological change called endosymbiotic theory that appears to suggest a a degree of cooperation between organisms, and it goes on, and. Yeah, I mean, so we, so we, we, we of course, uh, extend our condolences to her family. And if we have nothing else from Quincy, Massachusetts, at the BaseNet Studios, I'm Ed Jupin. And from Swiftwater, Pennsylvania, in the Pocono Mountain Studios, I'm Fred Boaz. I'm Holly Hurley from St. Louis, Missouri, and in the words of the great Lynn Margulies, I don't consider my ideas controversial, I consider them right. <laughs> <laughs> and from Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. The home of John Kennedy. We'll see you next time. And Conan O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs>